Hello, friends. Welcome to the Cold War Prepper. This is Lee, and this is our Tuesday night fiction book, um, nonfiction book club. Uh, our scheduled fiction book club was supposed to have been on August 31st, but I was involved with the funeral and everything else, and so that didn't happen. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm, next week we're going to I'm going to post the uh, book that we'll be using for. Uh, then our next nonfiction book, and I'll be po posting that here shortly. Uh, so I'll give you a week to get that ordered, and and then you know another week to to read it, uh, the first two chapters. So that will mean that next week is kind of a gap week. And so in order to to cover that, hello KP Heathen. Uh, so in order to cover that gap week, what I want to do is substitute so that next Tuesday, one week from today, we'll do the fiction book that we were supposed to have done last Thursday. And that's uh, Franklin Horton's The Borrowed World. Gosh, what a great series. I tell you, I am I am totally uh, in awe of Franklin Horton. He's got like four different series that I've got, at least a couple books in all, each one of the four, just a phenomenal set of books. And each one has a different, they're all connected. Uh, they all pretty much relate to each other. They all have some integration of characters and everything else. But each one has a different focus. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Borrowed World uh, series that we're going to be discussing is more focused on a group of uh, professionals who left for a, a, a uh, convention. Uh, they're, they're state employees, work for, a, for mental health, <clears throat> went to a convention. At the, at, at, I think it's Roanoke, is it, Richmond, in Richmond for the uh, uh, state of Virginia, something happens, they have to walk home, basically. And so it goes through all the different things. Two of them were preppers, and they had their bug-out bags in the in the car with them. Uh, they were armed and things like that, and the different things that they encounter. It goes through a great list of, of things to look for, how to survive. Oh, gosh, it's a great book. So that's the focus of this series we're going to be looking at is kind of a get-home series on uh, how do you get home in a post-apocalyptic world. So we'll be discussing that book next Tuesday. I'm, I'm already into book two of that series. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, here it is. And uh, I'm almost finished with book two, you can see there. Uh, this is uh, Ashes of the Unspeakable. So we're going to be focusing Tuesday on book one, which is uh, The Borrowed World. And we'll be discussing that and all the things that he has in there that are just so phenomenally great as far as information. Um, so, uh, Scott, thank you for posting KP Heathen's uh, link. If you all would just check him out, I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, Diana, too, welcome. Thank you for being here. Holly Ivins, good evening. Welcome. I hope everything is going well at your place now. Uh, Scott, let me see. Little Old Prepper, gosh, welcome. Great to see you. This is the third time that Little Old Prepper and I have been together today. Uh, and that reminds me, make sure I say something about nutrient survival here in just a minute. And then Scott. Okay. So nutrient survival. This is the 30 days of uh, preparation, uh, National Preparedness Month. And so I, I was supposed to have done a live a uh, uh, video yesterday on how to cook over an open, an open fire. <clears throat> I'll be working on that. We're going out of town tomorrow. I'll be working that on that over the weekend and have that out shortly. We have 30 different days. Today uh, was um, uh, Prepping with Sarge. He did a phenomenal video on 12 plants that you should, that every prepper should have planted in their, in their yard. Just a great video. Uh, there's a whole list of different people. I'll put that in the show notes, uh, all the different people who are uh, uh, Participating in the 30 days to, today is today's prepping with Sarge. Tomorrow, I believe, is there is uh, uh, oh gosh, Kyleen and Jonathan. What's their provident prepper? Provident prepper is tomorrow. I have another one coming up on the 14th, I believe, and that's going to be uh, cooking a meal from your uh, food storage. So I've got two that I'll be doing out of this whole group. Uh, yeah, the 14th. And then um, a friend of mine, I, as a matter of fact, I've interviewed her here, um, Prepper Potpourri, is doing one about uh, science or, or fiction books uh, with uh, uh, 
uh, in, in the post-apocalyptic genre. And so she and I have been talking about that. And so she's asked me about it, a bunch of the books I've read. She's even considering doing a live interview and talking about different genres of books. Uh, I, I recommended one today. Let me tell you, just such an exciting thing. Hickman Family Homestead. Uh, I believe that's the name of it here in just a minute. Uh, please, uh, the Happy Hickman Homestead. Uh, do me a favor, please subscribe to them. What a what a just delightful couple. Uh, they're here in town visiting their relatives. Uh, they sent me an email and said, hey, can we take you out to lunch? Uh, I figured we would just all go to lunch together, but we did. We went to lunch together at our favorite Mexican restaurant. Uh, <coughs> they wouldn't let us pay. Just a delightful, delightful couple. <coughs> they... Uh, from there, uh, I took them over. It just so happens that today's the long day that the uh, uh, LDS Provident Living Center is open. So I took them over and showed them a Provident Living Center, and they made some purchases of long-term survival food. And uh, then they let me know when they got back safe to where they're staying. So uh, they're going to do a little bit of a jaunt around the country, but do me a favor. I I've watched a couple of their videos, great videos, homesteading videos, canning information, stuff like that. Just, just a great couple. So, so do me a favor and, and if you would, please subscribe to them. Um, so if I can get uh, one of the uh, moderators to go ahead and, and put that link out there for them as well, that would be phenomenal. Thank you, little lone prepper. Uh, but they're just a great couple. Um, strongly encourage you to, uh, to, to, to get with them. Okay, so next we're going to finish up. Uh, chapter 9, and the summary of um, Southern Pepper One's book, United We Stand. Uh, and then we're going to be moving. We'll give you a week to order the book and then a week to read it. So our next uh, time we get together, two weeks from tonight, we're going to be discussing chapters 1 and 2 of the book on situational awareness. And it has some activities that you can practice so that you can start getting better skills at being aware of the situations around you. Great book, strongly recommend it. Uh, and of course, that's going to be our uh, discussion book for the next couple weeks after that. Uh, Clarity Jane 31, welcome. Hi, great to see you. Um, okay, so let's get into this one. This is, this is just, I tell you, there is so much information in such a small book. It's not that big and it's got just, Jam packed. There, there's no fluff. It's just here it is. Here's the data. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to know. And and it's just uh, very easy to read. Uh, very sound advice. Just love the death out of it. I, I asked him. I sent him an email. I said, Hey, Dave, can we uh, can we interview you on 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 the channel? And you know, just kind of easy easy introduction or an end. Uh, hello, Pat Butler. Great to see you. You made it. Um, and uh, anyhow. And he said, no, he promised his wife no more videos. So I, I imagine with his boots on the ground video that he does every single day uh, and reading all those emails, he's probably spending an awful lot of time. And uh, so I can understand that. And and uh, we aren't going to hold that against him. But, you know, this is a great little book. He has a, he has a plethora of knowledge and information. And uh, remember, he was a judge on uh, Doomsday Preppers. So, you know, one of those behind the sign, behind the scenes guys who gave all those scores to all the different kinds of preppers. He was one of those judges who assigned those scores. Uh, another one from Doomsday Preppers was Jason uh, from the Angry Prepper. He was one of the first preparedness people, prepper people uh, that was interviewed in that series or that they did a, a uh, thing on. So both of those guys still have their active channels here. And I strongly recommend that you, you subscribe to both of those as well. Uh, so that's the angry prepper. He also has the angry, tr angry truth. And then the other one is, of course, Southern Prepper One. Uh, great, great channels. Um, so let's get into Chapter 9, Additional uh, Tips for Long-Term Support. Number one, the time to build your network is now, not after it happens. You can supplement your network after it happens, but the time to build it is now. The time to develop all your policies and everything else and your, your preparedness planning is now, not after it happens. So, for example, I just uploaded uh, my food storage recommendations to our neighborhood uh, Facebook page, told people, here's what I recommend that you have available for the, so we can all eat together for a full year. 
And, uh, you know, this is how we're going to do it. This is the exchange rate. If you have this, this is what you will get as far as a soup or whatever in exchange for that. So in order to participate, you have to have at least six ounces of water per person who's going to be drinking or taking soup out of the pot. And you have to have at least, um, you know, um, six cubic inches of wood or three charcoal briquettes. And, and that's so that we can do all the, the cooking and the soup and everything else. And that's just the ticket so you can stand in line. Now that you're standing in line, you got to have something you can put into the pot in order to get something out of the pot. Uh, and so, you know, start thinking about those things now. What channel are you going to be on, on, on the radio? Um, we were talking last night. And I didn't put it in there. I, I'm sorry. I've got to put in the uh, UV8, uh, which is by Baofeng. That is the new dual capacity radio. So it's going to have the capabilities of being the ham VHF UHF repeater type uh, transponder, or I'm sorry, transceiver. And it's also going to be, uh, I believe it is GMRS uh, compatible. So you can program both of those in there. You can get two of those radios for about $54. And uh, I will put those, I'll put a link to those in the show notes tonight. I, I should have done it this morning, but today has just been one of those really, really busy days. Uh, my, my group meets at eight o'clock in the morning on Tuesday mornings. And then I had pain management today. And then we had lunch with the, the uh, Happy Hickman Homestead. And uh, yeah, it's just, what a great day. What a great, great day. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. I was talking, um, so the, the, my pain management doctor, she had a gastroenterologist doctor who was in seeing how they worked. And so he's doing his residency with her uh, for a short while uh, before, you know, all the things that doctors do. And so we were talking and I said, I'm getting a little bit of a tingling sensation in my toes. You know, and, and I watched a, a commercial on TV. And the commercial on TV said that, hey, oh, hello, Phyxerus, how are you doing? Hello, Tofu. I haven't seen you in a long time. Welcome. Um, and then, uh, but it showed a woman who had been a smoker, and she lost all of her toes. They had to amputate all of them from, um, what's it called? Uh, when, you're, when your toes go numb. Um, and, and so I said, I'm kind of worried, you know, my, my toes are getting numb and, and, and am I going to have to lose my toes? And so the doctor looked at me and says, Oh no, you don't show any of the signs whatsoever. Uh, neuropathy. You don't show any of the uh, neuropathy signs for, for your feet or hands. And, uh, when did you quit smoking? And I said, Oh, about seven years ago. And he says, Oh no, you're, you're good to go. It, 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 that type of thing. And I forget what it's called Geyer syndrome or something. I, I forget. Uh, but it only happens to people who are currently smoking. So Thank goodness. I'm, I'm, that's another one of those that I've kind of escaped biting the bullet. So when disaster strikes, if your emergency, if you don't have a formal um, organization, that's the time to start getting things formalized. So the first thing you want to do is a situation analysis. You want to look around what's going on. How, how big is it? How many people are affected? Uh, what do we imagine the duration is going to be? We start doing this analysis of, you know, are people going to need to be working together. Yeah. And if so, for how long? What are the potential threats? All those kinds of things. And then if it's bad enough, you want to get all your people together. Have a meeting. Say, hey, guys, here's, what's, here's what I believe is going on. Here's the information I have. And here is how we plan for it. So, you know, let's, let's go ahead and inst Im implement our plans. Uh, that could be an evacuation order. It could be staying in place. It could be establishing guard duties. It, there's so many things involved with that. You want to get all those things planned ahead of time so that when SHTF happens, you just immediately implement the plan that you've already put in place. Um, now, here's where a couple of things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to have to notify all your members. You know, uh, the Peter principle says that some of those key members are going to be the ones who are at work and can't get home or they are out of town and can't get home or, you know, the people you need the most uh, are just aren't going to be available. So make sure you have a primary and an alternate uh, for each one of those positions so that you can go ahead and get everybody integrated, coordinated and activating your plan to the greatest extent possible. Um, then hold that meeting. You know, here's what we need to do. Uh, who, who do we have available? What slots can we fill? 
Do we need to have guard duty? Do we need to have, uh, what communications do we have? Who is our communicator? All those different things that are going to be going on. Hello, Butch. Um, and then, uh, Addy, no, sweetheart. Come here. Uh, mobilize your, your group's uh, resources. Um, for example, one of the things that we've decided on is we're going to uh, have this one area that's going to be our feeding area. And so it has an established pavilion. It has an established grill and all those kinds of stuff. It has a couple of picnic tables. So that's going to be our common grounds for, for feeding uh, the, the community. So how do we get the food to there to prepare it? You know, so not everybody in the community is on board. So is there a threat from our neighbors of getting that food to the, the serve the cooking and serving point. And then once we get the cooking and serving points established, you know, is there a threat from people trying to take it from us? So the, all those things that you have to take into consideration as you activate your plan and get everybody working together. Um, so then community assistance, you know, uh, are we going to be depending upon the time of year, uh, for example, if it's if it's winter and people have lost power and now they don't have a way to uh, look at that. Can, way to go, Faxorus. All right. I, I put one on our Facebook page. Uh, last time I did try to do a, a um, organization meeting was about oh, two years ago. And I had two families show up and they are not the two families. I, I've got four families that are active with me right now. And those four families didn't show up to the planning meeting. I guess they don't want too many people to know that they're involved. But uh, two other families did show up, and they were the only ones. But uh, one of the key things that you have to um, worry about is the time of year. Okay, so uh, remember that people can freeze to death, and people can also die of heat stroke. So, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do to protect those people? So if you have a heating source, are you going to be bringing people in and keeping them into a warming center and keeping them warm? What are you going to do with all those people and how are you going to, to handle those people uh, or are they just going to be left on your own? So, you know, those are kind of some of the things we're going to have to look at as far as community assistance. Uh, maybe it might require that we turn that pavilion that we have where we're going to be serving our food uh, and dropping some tarps and turning that into our warming center. Uh, so, you know, there, there's all kinds of considerations like that. Spring and fall, probably not going to be that much of a problem, but, um, you know, winter and summer, they can tend to be big problems. Uh, we've, out of the last 105 days, we've only had two days below 100 degrees here in Central Texas. So to, to people who are one or two years older than I am, that can be a critical thing. That can, that, that can be very difficult to, to deal with. Um, you know, I'm, I grew up in El Paso and 112 in the summer, but it's 3% humidity. You get underneath the tree and it automatically drops 25 degrees. Uh, we had swamp coolers, and so all you did was add a little bit of humidity, and it would cool the temperature down 10 to 15 degrees. So, you know, I, I, went, I slept in 90-degree weather most of the time, uh, not like we have now here. Um, you know, so here a lot of people have become totally dependent upon um, central air conditioning, and if we don't have that, how many people are going to be able to adapt to the heat? So take those things into consideration. Um, You've got to continuously get those leaders that are, that are going to be your co-leaders with you uh, involved in making decisions. You know, the, you, you've got to meet at least daily. What is the situation today? Uh, have we had any additional people come in? Have we gotten any additional resources? Have we lost any resources? Uh, where are we? What's our projected expectation as far as how long we're going to do things? Uh, are there winter crops that we need to plant? Are there summer crops that we need to plant? All those different kinds of decisions. Uh, so, you know, find out who you have. I'm very sorry. I've got, I've got a, uh, what do you call it? Um, a scab. <laughs> I was trying to trim my mustache and my mustache scissors are sharp and I cut the very inside of my nose and it's just bugging the living daylights out of me. Um, sore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very happy it's not bleeding, but you know, sore. Um, that's almost good enough reason to shave off my beard and mustache. Um, make sure you keep notes of everything that's done, what people agree to, what people don't agree to, uh, because sometimes somebody will commit to something and say, no, that's not what I said. You know, so make sure you keep a record of everything that, that your leadership team agrees to and exactly how you're going to do things. Sometimes you don't think of something, you know, and, and you have to say, well, you know, we never thought of that. We'll have to meet and see what we're going to do. In the meantime, here's what we 
here's what we might want to do. This kind of makes sense. And then get your leadership group back together to agree on it or to change it. Um, and then one of the things you want to do, one of the things we were really good at in the Army uh, was as soon as we did something, we would come back in and we would debrief it. So we'd say, what was the situation? What did we do? What was the information we had available to us? What was the decision we made? Why did we make that decision? What were the options we had? Why did we reject those other options? Could they have been better options? Uh, what would we have needed as far as information or personality or uh, time or anything else in order to make a better decision next time? So we're always doing this. We're always assessing how did we do last time so that next time we can do better. And that's that debriefing. That's the whole purpose of a debriefing is to constantly improve. Um, Absolutely. Oh, my goodness gracious. I am so sorry. Yeah, when I lived in Houston, uh, you know, it, it would be in the 80s to 90 percent humidity. And that was just I, I had to carry it. I went to work at seven o'clock in the morning and had to carry a towel in the summer so I could wipe down uh, walking. I'm going to say maybe uh, 20 yards from the parking lot, from, from my parking space into the building. Uh, just that short walk at seven o'clock in the morning, I had to towel down before I got into the building. Just, uh, just, just terrible. Um, yes. So hello tofu agrees that, you know, keeping minutes and, and, uh, getting people committed to, to, you know, either, either for or against, and they don't have to provide a reason, but they can just say I'm for, or I'm against, and then record that or what they did. Um, So the one thing that, that, that I love here is uh, we are now in the fifth day of dove season. Uh, so we've got the migratory birds that are starting to do their migration south. Uh, so the dove are starting to move from the northern areas through central Texas down into uh, uh, down towards Mexico. So we've got about three weeks of dove season right now. And uh, so as long as even inside the city limits, as long as you've got 10 acres, and you're 150 feet away from the boundary of that property, uh, if it's a wide open field especially, you can hunt dove with a shotgun inside any 10-acre plot inside any city limits, as long as you're 150 feet away from uh, the boundary of that, uh, <clears throat> of that area. So, you know, that's, that's one of the great things here is, is you can go dove, dove hunting inside the city limits. Um, That that is a big problem, Pat, and and even more so than that, uh, I'm going to add a, throw another dimension in this for you, and that is finding somebody of a like mindset that you can trust. Okay, uh, I've invited a guy that I've known for 20 years, and he's single, and uh, but you know he's a you know 23rd degree black belt in in super you know kung fu and all those kinds of stuff, uh, a good shot. Yeah, and I know he has a CCW, uh, and um, I'm just, you know, all around good. And so I've invited him here, uh, and I said, you can come, because I'm going to need people to help protect. Uh, but I also know he has an extremely close friend that I haven't invited. And so, you know, will he turn against me in order to bring his friend. And that's one of those things you just don't know. So, you know, you got to kind of keep one eye open. So even somebody you've known for a long time and you kind of trust, you're still got that little bit of hesitancy that you're going to keep your eye open. So that's what people you know for a long time, people you haven't known very long at all, that's going to be even tougher. So, you know, it's, it's finding like-minded people you can trust. That's the key. That's going to be so, so difficult. Um, so in your post-emergency recovery, um, so how do you, how did you recover from the emergency? What do you want to do? What are the next steps? Uh, where do we want to go? How are we going to do it? Um, one of the big things that, that David points out here that I think you really need to take consideration of, and, and a really good resource is Prepping with Sarge. So watch his channels. He has another channel, and I forget the name of it right now, but he is a licensed uh, mental health therapist. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that I think is going to be um, critical is we have a lot of people that um, 
you know, right now, uh, we trust them. They, they have the expertise, they have knowledge and everything else. But a coward yesterday can be a hero today, and a hero today can be a coward tomorrow. And it all just depends upon mental stability of the situation. I, uh, I, I just, I just about lost it on, on 9-11. I could not believe that that was happening. And I've seen a lot of stuff and, and, you know, I, I just had to kind of catch myself and say, you know, gosh, don't, don't get caught up in this. You know, this is, this is not the end of the world yet, you know? And, and so I just kind of had to constantly talk to myself and say, you know, wait, you know, be aware, watch what's going on around you. Uh, if you're in this, in, in a state of panic, then you are no good to your family or to yourself. So, uh, you know, grab a hold of yourself. And so that mental preparedness, you know, you got to get that mental toughness now. And unfortunately, not everybody in your group is going to have that same level of mental toughness. Um, so, you know, when it comes to that first inclination of uh, the shoot or run, uh, that can be a life altering decision. Um, and so, you know, those, those, you need to have your wits about you to make those kinds of decisions. And, Unfortunately, not everybody's going to have the same mental toughness that we need to develop in order to be there when it happens. Um, so, you know, so just be aware of that. Um, um, so, you know, what can you do as far as community outreach and education? One of the things, I'm taking over a, a preparedness group that has been faltering now for about a year. <clears throat> the the uh, owner of the group on Meetup never really had any, I mean, everything was kind of laissez-faire on, on, on Meetup. Uh, it's got like 143 members. So I'm, I'm taking over the group and I'm going to start meeting on Saturday mornings at a, at a restaurant for breakfast. And I'm putting out a list of topics, you know, and this is what we're going to discuss on this day. And then I am going to take you over to the LDS Provident Living Center at the end of the meeting so that you can now purchase, um, you know, those things that we talk about in the meeting. So, you know, that just want to make sure that they, they have that opportunity. I think if people have something to gain from it, then they will give to it. Hello, Maccabeus. Welcome. Uh, let me see. Um, Yeah, and 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 your family knows that you have it, so they're going to come. Um, that is oh so true, oh so true. Uh, and even you know other people who who suspect but don't know, uh, you know they're going to they're going to try to come as well. Uh, that's why it becomes extremely important uh, that you have giveaway foods. So, you know, so cans of uh, beefaroni or spaghetti and meatballs or uh, those little cups of ramen soup. A cup of noodles, I think they're called, that cost less than a dollar each. That's why I have packets of oatmeal, uh, so that when people come to my door that I don't know who they are or what their intentions are, I can say, let me see if I can find something for you. And I'll take a couple minutes to go find it, even though I know exactly where it is. And I can hand it to them and I can say, you know, I'm going to have to make this work. If they say, I say, how many people in your family, you know, how many are we going to feed? And they say, well, you we got four. I'm not going to give them four. I'm going to give them three. I'm going to say, look, this is all I have. I'm sorry. You know, uh, but never give them what they're asking for. Always give them less to let them know that you are on very short supply. Another thing is during those first couple of days, during the first couple um, uh, weeks of, of post SHTF, do not put any trash out because if you've got empty tin cans of SpaghettiOs out in your, your trash can out in the backyard or front yard, and people see that you have all kinds of canned goods or all kinds of freeze-dried goods or anything else that you're throwing away the, the containers for, obviously you've got something you're eating inside. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that there's a containment area inside. I'm going to use my garage. So we've got some big trash cans in the garage. I'll, I'll flatten the cans. The cans will go into a uh, contractor bag. Contractor bag goes into the, along with some, uh, uh, you know, smelly stuff to make sure that I, I odor control uh, so that people can't um, uh, get the scent of, of, of the stuff that's in there. And I will wait probably a month or two after SHTF before I dispose of those contractor bags. Uh, but nobody's going to know that I have any trash. And that's one of the ways you're going to keep people from wanting what you have. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, 
So, yeah, so we we uh, we aren't that far away. We're probably about 45 minutes from the LDS uh, Provident Living Store. But, you know, the, the good news is we have one. So, uh, gosh, I've been buying uh, a mixed case. I, I usually buy, a, you know, six cans. I've been buying six cans a month now since 95. So that's, what, 28 years? Uh, of course, we have to eat some of it. We've been going through it and rotating it. But, uh, yeah, right now I'd say one of the things you really want to stock up on is going to be flour. It looks like flour, rice, sugar are going to be the three things that are going to be in great, great, great uh, shortage come here very quickly. And corn as well. Um, yeah, uh, you know, um, so we've had – uh, a couple of attacks in the U.S., but you're absolutely right. Anybody by ch perchance know where the 18, it was? No, it was actually the early 1900s, I believe. Let me look it up. Um, it, it, in, in a little place called Columbus, New Mexico, and uh, that was uh, Pancho Villa. Uh, Nineteen eighteen. So Pancho Villa attacked Columbus, New Mexico in 1918, and they sent this general, Blackback Jack Pershing, and this uh, young cavalry captain by the name of uh, George Patton, and they went down to Fort Bliss, which is El Paso, and then moved west towards Columbus, which is only uh, about 100 miles west of El Paso, if even that far. And so that was where they, they drove away uh, Pancho Villa and his gang out of uh, continental U.S. But you know, I don't think New Mexico was a state at that time. Uh, same thing, we had the, the attack on Pearl Harbor in, in 1941, but, Pearl, but that was not a state at that time. We had the Aleutian campaigns. I think it was Attu Island, uh, in, the, in the Aleutian Island change, was a major battle. Uh, and that was in 1942, 41-42. Philippines was a protectorate. Um, we, we got the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico as a result of the Spanish-American War. Uh, so, you know, of course, the Philippines were attacked. So, yeah, we've had very few attacks on, on U.S. And so that was a very shocking thing for almost all of us. We never imagined that would happen, even though there was a precursor, what, just seven years before that, when they tried to do the bomb down in the uh, parking garage underneath. Um, or just stay where you are and, and let alone prepper. If you can make it here, you're welcome here as well. So, um, uh, there is a fantastic book, um, and it is, let me look it up here real quick. Um, and Jeff. Ross. And I'm sorry, Jason Ross and Jeff Kirkham wrote this book. Jeff Kirkham book. I think it's Black Autumn. I just want to make 100% sure here. Yes, Black Autumn series. Uh, so Jeff Kirkham and Jason Ross. Uh, wrote a series called the Black Autumn series. And that all takes place in and around Salt Lake City. I mean, in, in Federal Heights, just up the valley from the Mormon Temple and uh, and everything else. And uh, so really, really interesting about, and, and there's very a lot of really good information about how the Mormon church works and, and authority and everything else. Really great book. So Black, Black Autumn series. We might consider doing that uh, after we get through with the Franklin Horton and the A American series. We've also got a new book coming out from uh, Stephen Smith here in the next month or two. I mean, there's all kinds of great authors out there. I, I've got to put in an order. Um, Bill Forshine has put out his newest book, uh, which is a five-year follow-up to uh, One Year Later, or something like that, but this is book four in his series. So, I mean, there's all kinds of great fiction books coming out right now. Um, hello, Bus Stop. Welcome. Um, let me see here.
Yeah, I I, uh, I think I told you all my my son-in-law accepted a job in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, my daughter brought over. They they had to pay for their own sh- movement. Uh, so she brought over all the uh, long-term food storage stuff I had bought for her. Of course, the the gun laws in in New Jersey and here are different. So the the things that I had bought for her around that uh, notion got returned. Uh, I had also given her a 5kW gas generator, and so that got returned. So now she's in New Jersey, which is really close to ground zero for anything that might happen, uh, with nothing, and I have all of her stuff here. So, you know, just that's how life works, I guess, you know, and and, uh, I wish it weren't that way, but, you know, wishing isn't going to change anything. Um, You know, Fraxerus, here's, here's, I was talking with uh, the Hickmans today, um, and, uh, what I, I've been debating whether or not I should buy a hand uh, grain mill and then get grains instead of just buying cornmeal and flour. And uh, so what I found was, yeah, I can get the, the, the whole grain red wheat and white wheat, hard white wheat, uh, a lot cheaper than flour, and I can grind it. But I can't find the sweet corn to grind to turn into masa or to turn into uh, cornmeal. So I've just decided instead of trying to get that stuff for a long term, you know, it's probably going to store for about five years as it is. If I put it in a uh, vacuum sealed bag with air, with an oxygen absorber. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue to buy uh, cornmeal and flour instead of uh, the other stuff and have to grind it myself. So just that's a decision I just made today. that I'm not going to go the route of uh, <clears throat> of uh, uh, grinding and, and storing uh, the, the hard wheat, let's put it that way, and the corn. Uh, little Lauren Prepper says that they're they're out of uh, peanut butter. Wow. Um, oh wow. Well, I wish you luck. Um, I don't know if I would do it here because it only gets down to about eighty five degrees at night here. And gosh, I like my air conditioning. So. Uh, oh really? That's good information. Thank you. I'll have to. Uh, See if I can't get an AM radio and listen to that. Um, I have a friend uh, on Facebook, uh, James, and he swears by Coast to Coast Radio. But uh, I I just don't. That's a little bit too late for me to be up. You know, we old farts, we have to go to bed early. So. um, Oh, Clarity Jane has a great idea here, and that is popcorn uh, in place. So to use that for cornmeal. Wow. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Jiminy. Holly, have a nice evening and thank you for being here. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, Jewelers Loop and Gold testing kit in case I have to take jewelry as a barter app. Another thing you might want to consider there, little alone prepper, is to get yourself a good scale. Uh, make sure it's in grams uh, and, and probably down to at least a tenth of a gram, maybe even a hundredth of a gram. So, the, you know, the, the I would probably say that the uh, uh, gold testing kit and the uh, scale are critical. Uh, the Jewelers Loop is optional. That's my opinion. I, I do have the, the test kit and I also have the scales. I don't have, I do have a loop. I just don't know where it is. Um, but uh, um, um, vintage magic mill grinder, both electric and hand crank. I was watching, so I, you know, trying to do a lot of research on what hand crank, what mill to buy. I was watching some German guys and they were grinding hops to make beer. And so he took the hand off and, and where the hand crank attaches to the spindle, to the uh, axle there, uh, that was actually wide enough to where you could put a, uh, it, would, it would fit onto a uh, hand drill. And so he put his hand drill in there and, and just, you know, there was, there was um, grist everywhere. But uh, and he, then he showed us a cardboard cutout that he made to direct the, all this flying uh, powders down into the uh, tub where his collection tub. Really, really interesting. And I, I, 
yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to get flour. <laughs> uh, that's all. That, I'm just going to make it that easy. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lazy that way. Um, uh, let me see here. Okay. So, um, uh, resupply, what are you going to do for resupply and uh, preparation? Because, you know, just it, it, that's, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the circular rule where just as soon as you recover from one, the next one's going to hit. So, you know, as soon as you recover from that initial stage, start getting yourself ready. What are we going to do to prepare in case this happens or in case that happens? Start doing a whole bunch of what if scenarios. Um, then uh, emergency preparedness training. How are you going to train the people that you work with you now? How are you going to train those once you acquire them? Uh, are you going to have some sort of a training plan or, for example, uh, how do you move to engage or how do you move to disengage or uh, how do you do uh, bounding overwatch or, you know, what is the difference between direct fire and covering fire and or, or uh, you know, and so you have all these different things you're going to have to teach people that, that they don't know that you're going to have to teach them. So make a list of all that and start planning on who's going to do the training and, and what you're going to, excuse me, what you're going to train them in. Another good one would be about night blindness and, you know, how to look off to the side because you don't want to use your cones. You want to use your rods. Uh, I, 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 and I forget that it could, I could be opposite, but, uh, you know, you, you want to use the, the, the ones that you, for your peripheral vision at nighttime because the ones that show color uh, are not that good at night. And so you're not going to see anything except the real good movement. Um, uh, let me see. 1 a.m. Eastern time. That's midnight here. No, no. I'm going to be in deep in La La Land, so I won't be talking with, I won't be listening to Bill Fortune. Maybe there will be a, um, a replay of that that I can listen to. Uh, one, of the, one of the other things you're going to have to take into consideration is legal and ethical issues. Uh, you know, at what point do you say, um, you know, what are we going to do for crime and punishment? How are we going to... Uh, uh, enforce things. One of the things you don't want to do too often is banishment because every time you banish somebody, that's somebody who has extensive knowledge of the interior operations of your organization that you're sending away to feed that information to another group so that they can come in and this person can get even with you. So I, I, am, I am totally against banishment. You got to do everything you can to try to reconcile the differences between the two, punish the deed, uh, you know, make sure you keep the person with dignity and respect and, and um, you know, see where you can go from there. Uh, let me see. That's pretty close to it. Yes, yeah, so you want to build a, what he calls a resilient community. Um, and just make sure you have a whole bunch of like-minded people. Uh, and, and one of the things, you know, we can, we can take a look at what's happening in our country right now. Um, if we take a look at the national debates, right now they say that the, the, the vote is 36-36. So 36% of the people say they're for a particular candidate, and the other 36% of the people say that they're for the other candidate. Really, in my humble opinion, I think that the 36% who say they're for this guy, it's really that they are against the other guy. And that goes both directions. And I think that the middle group, uh, the, the middle 28%, are looking for somebody to vote for. Uh, everybody else has made up their mind who they're voting against, but now who are we going to vote for? And that's an unanswered question. So that's one of those things that, that we have to keep in mind, that kind of a mentality when we get into a post-apocalyptic world. And that is, what are we in this for? Paint a picture of the future. Give something that's going to be a common driver that gives people a reason to get through it together. You know, my mantra is, we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Uh, and, and then that's a reality. Uh, we have to say, we have to paint that picture. We have to say, here is our goal. Here's where we want to be. It can only be accomplished if we're all in this together. So that means in order for you to survive, I've got to be there with you. In order for me to survive, I've got to protect you and you've got to be there with me. You know, let me tell you about the military. Uh, in the military, when you're down in the trenches, Apple pie, flag, 
All that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is the guy to your left and the guy to your right. We are there to look out for each other, to take care of each other. That's the bond, okay? So regardless of what anybody else says, we're going to do it, but I'm going to do it taking care of the two guys, one on either side of me. We're going to take care of each other. That's kind of the mentality we have to have as we build our groups and is, you know, how are we going to get through this together? Uh, what am I going to do to support you to make sure that you live? And what are you going to do to make sure that I live? And I think that's that's one of the things we've got to consider. And one of the things we've got to stress as we go forward is um, the, the togetherness aspect of it. Um, I don't either. I, I know the C's are, are clarity, cut, and carrots, the three C's. Uh, but to tell you the cuts or to tell you how to measure clarity or to tell you how to, uh, I can measure carrots. Uh, I can do that, but that, that's about it. Um, wow. Yeah, it was 100. And, no, I think today was only 99 degrees. Yeah, today was a 99 degree day. No, no, yesterday was 99 degrees. Today was 102. Uh, tomorrow's going to be 102 again. Don't know what it is right now. My phone's over there charging. Uh, I was on it so much today that I ran it out of uh, electricity. Um, oh, look at that. So Fiexorus also found a way to get a, a drill uh, into a uh, into a grinder. That's fantastic. Uh, that's great. Um, Isn't that the truth? And all these people supposedly had something in common, you know, what they were all there for. And I guess, you know, uh, all of a sudden when, when you feel challenged or when you feel like your life is threatened, uh, all that camaraderie goes down the tubes and it's, it's a fight for survival. And my survival means more to me than your survival. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why we place so much uh, value on the Medal of Honor is because the recipients of the Medal of Honor have proven by their actions that your life in their eyes is more valuable than their own life. So they are really uh, willing to do something to protect their fellow man. Um, so what happened was they had that hurricane come in uh, off the, the Pacific coast and went up through Baja and then it crossed over just by San Diego and moved up into Nevada and into the desert. So they had flash flooding. Uh, so the Burning Man event um, became just a mud, mud bath. And, and people were stuck in there uh, up to their ankles in mud. Uh, none of the vehicles could get out. They had no provisions uh, for uh, evacuation. They had no provisions for long-term survival as far as food, water, and all those other kinds of things. And of course, once situations start going bad, people start panicking. And then panic is a contagious disease. And so the more that one, you know, when one person panics, uh, then you got two, then four, then eight. And pretty soon it becomes everybody's panicking over something you probably shouldn't panic about. Uh, probably would not have been as bad if people hadn't panicked, but you know, they did. And that's uh, that's where it happened. Um, oh, wow. I didn't hear that, but uh, yeah, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, so that's what I heard, uh, that there was a shortage of food, water, couldn't get out. Um, and so they were, they were panicking and taking from each other and, and harming each other to get it and everything else. Uh, so, yeah. And, uh, that's, I, I have not heard, I, I, I have gotten to the point now to where I really don't watch that much news. I watch news first thing in the morning. Uh, and that's about it. So, you know, a lot of the things I don't, I, I don't, as a matter of fact, I was even talking to somebody today and I said, you know what? Oh, I know what it was. It was our men's breakfast. Uh, and I said, you know what, I don't want to be one of those channels that's telling people what, the, you know, that this is why you have to prep. Uh, the people who come to my channel know they have to prep and, and I'm just trying to give them some ideas 
we can share ideas. You have great ideas. I've learned a lot from you. Uh, hopefully, uh, I tell you what I'm doing. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. If you like it, you can accept it. You can do the same thing. Uh, but we are an, an information exchange channel uh, so that we're helping each other to find ways to overcome what is inevitable, uh, whether it's going to be Yellowstone or whether it's going to be uh, economic chaos or whether it's going to be uh, uh, thermonuclear war. I don't know. But, but what I do know is there are certain things that we need to do in common, and that is food, water, shelter, uh, you know, nuclear protection and things like that. So. Okay, so somebody else is saying yes. Scott saying that yes, he heard that it was a drug, accidental drug overdose. Uh, uh, let me see. Yes, reloaders do have very sensitive scales. I think it's down to grains, not you know, which is a a, a fraction of a gram. So. Um, so. Uh, Let me see. And and the problem is I just don't trust them anymore. So so whether they are lying or not, I don't know when they are and when they aren't. Uh, I just don't trust them. I can't I can't rely on having good information provided to me. Uh, I don't want commentary. I want facts. And uh, let me. I'm an intelligence analyst. I was trained. I was trained how to analyze facts and come up with a conclusion. Don't do that for me. I want to do my own work. You know, um, there are other people that maybe need your analysis. I don't. I want the facts, and uh, I, it's very difficult to get just pure facts anymore. And and you know, up until Walter Cronkite, you could do that. Walter Cronkite, uh, I think it was the Tet Offense of 1968, uh, where he kind of switched and became an anti-war correspondent. But up until that time, you know, pretty much news was facts. You know, they gave you here's what it is, make of it what you want. And then after that, he, um, uh, Ted Brokaw and, uh, gosh, what was it? Chet. Um, uh, good night, Chet. Good night, Ted. Ted Brokaw, Chet Huntley Brinkley, Chet, Chet Huntley and Ted and, and Brinkley. What was his name? Anyhow, up until that time, there was all fact. And then it started getting more and more towards, uh, uh, evaluation, politically aligned evaluation. And then CNN came along. Uh, CNN came along right at uh, the um, time when Desert Storm happened, um, you know, and, and that was, and I thought they, when they first came out, I thought they were a very factual, unbiased organization, and I, and I really liked them. Uh, watched them through most of Desert Storm, and then they started picking up that same kind of a, of a slant. Every uh, news reporter has the slant. And, uh, you know, so I, I was, we had this discussion just the other day as well with somebody. You know, and if you, if you imagine a baseball diamond, um, you know, you want the news to be right over second base. And it's okay if it veers over to shortstop every once in a while. It's okay if it veers over towards the second baseman every once in a while. But you don't want it to go any further than that. But what we've seen happen is, uh, that news has gone all the way over to the third baseman, then to the third base coach. Now there are even a couple channels that go all the way over to the third base coach. So that anybody who is at the second base is considered to be extreme right. But then in order to counter that, you wanted to move that back a little bit. So you got some organizations that are at the first base area that are, you know, so now you have this wide dispersion and you say, who do you believe? You know, which one's right? Which one do you believe? And, uh, you got to kind of say that the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. David Brinkley, thank you, ABC Patriot. Uh, Huntley Brinkley, and and uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I think that's pretty close to it. We're getting close to an hour. Uh, anybody have any other final questions? This is a fantastic book. I will put the link for it in uh, in the show notes. Uh, I will not get to it this evening. We're, we're leaving very early tomorrow morning to work on the estate, uh, my sister-in-law's estate. Uh, so I won't be able to get to it tonight. I won't be able to get to it tomorrow. Uh, the earliest that I'll be able to get all the stuff, the, uh, the new book that we'll be doing, this one, as well as the old book, this one, 
I'll get those into the show notes. The earliest that's going to happen is going to be Thursday, but I will get it done for you. I'm going to write myself a note and a reminder. Um, Okay. I have a subscription to Epoch Times, and and yes, I like them. There are those who accuse it of being right-wing, but I do like the fact that they don't do that much analysis. They give you pretty much facts. And uh, yes, I do like that that organization. Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, we'll end this one with numbers, chapter six, verses twenty four, twenty five, and twenty six. Uh, so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and grant you peace. Um, oh, I, I wanted to tell you one more thing, and, and that is uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 o'clock Pacific time, which is 5 o'clock Central, 6 o'clock Eastern, uh, Nutrient Survival is doing a one-hour live, and that's going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays. Every live, they're having a drawing. So if you're looking for giveaways, you know, this is the thing to do it. They are also uh, doing a, uh, if you order anything once it's announced on Thursday. So if you order anything from the Nutrient Survival website, and that's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you use Alaska Prepper, uh, and and that's going to be AP20. So if you use the code AP20, that's going to get you a 20% discount on anything and everything you order from Alaska, uh, from Alaska Prepper, anything you order from Nutrient Survival. Uh, you are also going to be entered into a grand prize giveaway. Go to their website. Uh, I'm sorry, to their, yeah, their website, NutrientSurvival.com. They, you, can, you don't have to buy anything. You can enter there thousands of dollars worth of giveaways. I mean, um, solar panels. Uh, a month's supply of food. There's all kinds of great stuff. So make sure you go there as well. You've got to be on the lives if you want to get the stuff that they're giving away on the live. So make sure you're on the live. And yeah, thank you. Uh, Hello Tofu, code AP20. And uh, so, you know, so that's one really good deal for the rest of this month. Don't forget, and I will put in the show notes Thursday when I get the chance, we have 30 days. This is National Survival preparation month. And so uh, we're going to have 30 different uh, shows on preparedness. Uh, Like I said, I was supposed to have one yesterday over cooking over an open fire. I will be doing that one Friday and putting it out a couple days late. On the 14th, which is going to be Thursday, a week from this coming Thursday, I'm doing one on cooking with survival food. So uh, a lot of great uh, content contributors. City prepping is in there. Alaska prepper is in there. Um, Gosh, Provident Prepper is in there, uh, Prepper Potpourri. I mean, I, I am honored that they that I am being included in this list. Prepping with Sarge did one today. Great list of people, uh, great list of topics. Please uh, check out the list when I put it in there on Thursday. So remember, we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other. Do me a favor. Uh, now is the time, if you can afford it, uh, find the charity of your choice. And, and I'm thinking about starting one here. Uh, but the only problem with me starting one here is it only serves my community. So rather than say I'd like to f- serve some of the people who need it here in my community, I would much rather you just donate. Find a food bank. Find an organization. Salvation Army is a superior organization. Give a little. I'm not going to say give a lot. I'm just going to say give a little. Uh, give something so that you can help your fellow man and designate that towards going towards Thanksgiving because there are all kinds of people who won't have a Thanksgiving without our help. So be kind, polite, courteous, and respectful to each other because togetherness is what's going to get us through this. Okay? Y'all have a wonderful evening. I will see you Tuesday evening. And we'll be doing the fiction um, book that we should have done on Thursday. And that is going to be uh, Franklin Horton's The Borrowed World. Take care, everybody. Good night.
Uh-oh. So emergency alert, nuclear attack options are being broad, broadcasted like crazy tonight from New York Prepper. So if you watch him, New York Prepper. Okay, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.